Thanks for coming to my talk. This is Broken Brokers in Boxes, Fuzzing Breaks Everything, Even Erlang. And this is a story about how I found three different vulnerabilities in open source message brokers earlier in 2021. Uh, we're going to start out with a little bit of an introduction, uh, just talking about what a message broker is and why it's important, uh, and a little bit about how it works. And then we'll review fuzzing. We'll talk about various different domains of fuzzing, how to make good test cases, uh, and especially how this applies to network protocol fuzzing, which is what I used in this research. Then we'll talk about how software fails. Uh, it, there's a lot of different ways for software to fail, and so we'll discuss some of those uh, and what their implications are. I'll briefly touch on why Erlang is a good environment for message brokers and other types of sort of highly available, highly concurrent uh, service applications. Uh, and then uh, I'll talk about how I took the uh, targets of my fuzzing, these different message brokers, and put them in Docker containers as a way to help me find uh, resource exhaustion problems. Uh, and then finally, we'll sum up. So um, as I mentioned, the vulnerabilities that I found are in message brokers. And the easiest way to explain a message broker is that it's kind of like Slack for robots. It's kind of like a messaging system for all of the different parts of a, of a system. Uh, so you can see in the picture here, uh, like Slack, it has a publisher subscriber model where um, uh, you, you can join a channel or, or a room, uh, or in message broker terms, it's called a message queue, and you can publish messages to that queue. And then uh, various subscribers are, are able to subscribe to specific message queues, and every time somebody publishes a message into it, they get notified, they get the message. Um, and of course, uh, system components can be publishers and subscribers, but uh, that's the fundamental uh, function of a um, message broker. Um, where would you use these? Uh, all sorts of places. So uh, one example would be um, maybe you're an electric power utility and uh, you have smart meters on, on thousands or tens of thousands of homes. Maybe those are all publishing to uh, various message queues and then you've got back-end billing systems or, or monitoring systems that can um, pull the messages from those message queues and do whatever work they need to do. Um, likewise, you could imagine maybe an Internet of Things uh, home security system where the various door and window sensors are publishing uh, messages or events into message queues and getting picked up by other parts of the system. Um, and on and on. You, you can see that a message broker can be uh, a very central and very important part of a larger application system. The vulnerabilities themselves uh, are, there are three of them in three different message brokers. Uh, so one in RabbitMQ, which is a, a pretty popular open source message broker, one in EMQX, and one in VernMQ. And all of these uh, I found using protocol fuzzing. Uh, so uh, the, the way the message passing works is via network protocols. And so for RabbitMQ, um, I used um, uh, fuzzing of the AMQP protocol. And for the other two, EMQX and VernMQ, I used fuzzing of, um, of the MQTT protocol. Uh, so that's all well and good, but wouldn't it be fun to actually see something break? So let's go take a look at that. So I'm going to show you. Uh, I'm going to, I actually have RabbitMQ running here uh, inside a Docker container, and it's gone through all of its initialization, and it's it's ready for business. It's, it's listening for incoming uh, network protocol connections uh, in AMQP. And then I have a, an exploit script, uh, which we're going to look at a little later. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to run that script uh, so you can see what it looks like when it fails. So I'm going to, it's just a little Python script, so I'm going to run it here. And then over here, 
Um, that's it. That, that's the fireworks right there. That was RabbitMQ going down. Uh, so you can actually see this time uh, we got a couple of messages about um, memory. And, and that's, in fact, the problem that, uh, that this vulnerability is, is that um, it chews up all the available memory and the container gets uh, shut down automatically. The process gets shut down automatically. Okay. So I know it wasn't really like stuff blowing up, but uh, this, this is kind of the nature of application security where um, it doesn't look like much, but it's pretty important. Okay, so uh, I told you that I used fuzz testing in order to locate these vulnerabilities. So let's talk a little bit um, about what fuzz testing is and all the different ways that you can do that. Um, HD Moore uh, created this definition of fuzzing, which is pretty great. Basically, it says you're sending data that's intentionally malformed to uh, an application. And if the application can't handle it, if it fails in some way, then you know you've found uh, a vulnerability that might be able to be exploited. Uh, this definition implies a few different things. So first it implies that somehow you're going to come up with this uh, badly formed data or, or lots of badly formed data. So somehow you're going to create test cases that you want to deliver. And then second, you do actually have to deliver them to your target. And then third, you have to know if some failure occurred in the target software. So there's kind of three steps in fuzzing. You, you figure out what the test cases are, you deliver them to the target, and you try to figure out if something broke, if something failed. Um, interestingly, uh, so that's pretty open-ended, right? Uh, fuzzing means you deliver badly formed input to something and see if it breaks. And so there, there's actually lots of different layers at which you can do fuzz testing. Uh, so um, you can do uh, arguments to individual functions. And in fact, if you're familiar with libfuzzer, which is part of the LLVM ecosystem, uh, there's some support for this sort of built into that, that compiler uh, ecosystem. Uh, you can fuzz command line arguments. So you can call command line applications with weird and funky uh, arguments and see what happens. Or for applications that process some kind of file, you can mess that up. You can fuzz that and create various weird input files and see what happens. Uh, likewise, in, in web forms, in web applications, uh, you can fuzz the parameters, the things that are getting filled into the form, essentially, and as well as other parts of um, HTTP requests. Uh, APIs can be fuzzed. They take input, um, so you can create badly formed inputs for that. And then, of course, network protocols as well. So network protocols are just uh, conversations between different pieces of software over a network. Uh, they have a certain form. Uh, they're expecting certain kinds of messages, and so you can fuzz that. You can create badly formed network protocol messages and deliver them to a target. The, the part about creating the test cases, uh, there's actually some subtlety there. And um, th first of all, there's, it's an infinite space problem. So for any input, you can create an infinite number of badly formed inputs. But nobody has infinite time for testing. So uh, what you want to do with fuzzing is use a technique that gives you higher quality test cases. And what I mean by higher quality is, they look more like what they're supposed to look like, even though they're still deliberately malformed. And the reason is this. Uh, there's this spectrum from easy to ignore to looks legitimate for test cases. And if, you, if somebody said, OK, write a fuzzer, probably the first thing you would do is just create completely randomized inputs, test cases. And uh, that is OK, but it doesn't work very well because almost every test case that you create uh, is not looking at all like what it's supposed to look like. And so for the target software, it gets this randomized piece of data, this message, and it's very easy to ignore. So it, you know, it might look for a certain header, 
and it won't find it because it's most of the time because it's randomized data. So it's very easy to ignore these test cases and we would say that they have low quality because they don't really get into that target software and go down different control pathways and exercise that software. Um, if you're familiar with the, the infinite monkeys theorem, um, you know, if, if they are actually random test cases, just because of randomness, eventually you'll randomly choose something that kind of looks the way it's supposed to look, but it's going to take a really long time to get there. So the test case quality is low for random fuzzing. Um, the, the next step up from that is template fuzzing or mutational fuzzing. And here you, you start out with a, a known good input or message, that's the template. And then in order to create test cases, you introduce anomalies into that. You mutate it in various ways and create test cases that way. It's better because the test cases kind of look the way they're supposed to look. So you're going to go down some interesting control paths in your target software. But um, it has shortcomings too. So if, um, if you're doing network protocols and the messages have like length fields or checksum fields or session IDs or other, you know, semantically meaningful things, the template father doesn't really know anything about that. It's just, you know, messing up uh, starting from a known good template uh, input. And so it doesn't really know anything about those. And so it's, um, while the test case quality is better, significantly better than random, uh, we can still do better than that. And so better than that is what we call generational fuzzing or model-based fuzzing. And here, the, the fuzzing tool understands the, the data that it's, that it's creating test cases for. So if it's a, a file format fuzzer, uh, it knows what the file should look like. So if it's a, a JPEG fuzzer, it knows the specification of a JPEG and how that file should look and what the different structures are and the fields inside. Uh, or likewise with a network protocol fuzzer, it knows what each message should look like and what each field means. And that allows it to uh, systematically break every rule and create test cases that are very close to correct, which means they'll go down lots of control pathways, but they are still bad. They're still deliberately malformed, uh, which helps uncover the vulnerabilities, the bugs in the target software. And then you may have heard of uh, coverage guided fuzzing. Oh, I, I have a, a, a surrealist painting here because that's, that's my analogy for generational fuzzing, which is it's, it's kind of things that look familiar, but they're put together in, in unfamiliar ways and they kind of mess with your mind. Um, so you've, you've probably heard of uh, coverage guided mutational fuzzing. Uh, or Amer American Fuzzy Lop is sort of the most famous uh, uh, fuzzer of this kind. And um, this is a, it's like an uh, enhanced version of template fuzzing where um, you, you are mutating a known good input to, to create the test cases, but every time you deliver a test case, you actually uh, examine the control paths that got executed in the target binary and then Based on that information, you use that to guide how you're doing the mutation to create subsequent test cases. So for example, every time AFL gets to a new control pathway, it sort of takes a note and then uses that as a starting point for further mutations of test cases. But uh, the general rule is if you're fuzzing, you want to have high quality test cases to give you the best chance of finding bugs in the testing time that you have available. Uh, and so let's talk, you know, specifically in the arena of network protocol fuzzing, um, what are network protocols? So they're really just conversations uh, where um, this is a capture from Wireshark for the, sorry, for the AMQP protocol. And you can see the conversation starts with, um, some uh, somebody connects to the message uh, broker and sends this protocol header message just saying, okay, uh, here I am, I'm, I'm speaking 
AMQP, uh, here's the version of the protocol that I use, and, and there's the response to that. And then after that, you can do other messages like open or begin and so forth. Uh, and the point of this is that um, if you're going to do network protocol fuzzing right, you have to understand the whole conversation. So if you want to deliver uh, fuzzed test cases of the open message, in order to deliver those effectively, you first have to open up the connection, send the protocol header, get the protocol header response, and then send your test case, your anomalized open message. So that's one tricky thing about um, fuzzing network protocols. Uh, likewise, if there's a session ID or something like that, you want your fuzzer to be able to handle that correctly so that it can get the conversation to the point where you actually deliver the badly formed input, the badly formed message, the test case. Um, another thing that makes uh, uh, where, where generational fuzzing really excels is with these TLV structures. So TLV stands for type length value, and it's a common way of encoding uh, data in messages or protocols or file formats. Uh, so what we're looking at here, this is a capture of an AMQP open message. So remember, this is like midway through the conversation. Um, the endpoints have to have already exchanged the, the protocol header messages, and then here's an open message. Uh, and the, the highlighted blue part is the actual AMQP message, and the rest of it's like the, the TCP and IP headers and, and so forth. And so I'm just going to highlight uh, a couple of TLV structures for you in here. Um, if you look at the ASCII dump, you can see there are actually some human readable uh, uh, words or, or codes in here. Uh, and so the first one is right here. Uh, it's for uh, sort of a, an identifying name, which we've got as my broker. But in order to encode that into this protocol, um, we give it a type. So uh, we're saying, OK, coming up here is a string, which is somehow type A1. And then, um, hang on, let me get my pointer on here. And then there's a length. We'll say, OK, this string is uh, eight octets, eight bytes long. And then the value, which is the actual ASCII of, of the string. Uh, so that's what a TLV structure looks like. And if you think about fuzzing a TLV structure, um, a mutational fuzzer wouldn't doesn't know anything about what the types are or what the length means. Um, but a generational fuzzer understands that. So if, for example, they wanted to try out a very long value, uh, they could adjust the length appropriately uh, so that it, the, the message would still look pretty correct to the target software, um, but it would be able to exercise sort of the length of whatever buffer that was going to get read, read into. Um, here's a, another TLV type structure. Um, so you can see uh, ENUS here and FIFI. These are these are both um, these are both locale designators. So like a, a language and a location specifier. Um, and here again, there's a, a type uh, A3, whatever that means, um, and then a length of five and the value here. This one is the FIFI. And then actually in this one, there's another length and another value. Uh, so another length of five and the ENUS. So that's, that's this whole structure here and down here. And those are TLV structures. And again, if you think about creating fuzz test cases, you can see that a, a generational fuzzer would really understand how these are structured, what they should look like, and be able to kind of systematically break the rules. So um, here, this one's fun. So on the top is that uh, that same MQP open message, and on the bottom is one of the test cases. It's it's anomalized, and this is the one that can actually break RabbitMQ. Uh, and so it's like uh, in the 
in the comics in the newspaper, they've got the spot the difference uh, puzzle. Um, but here, I'm just going to show you. So actually, the only difference between these two messages, so the top one's valid, and the bottom one breaks RabbitMQ, or, or previous versions of RabbitMQ. The only difference is that um, my fuzzer has, has changed one of the T values in the TLV structure. So instead of an A3, uh, we've specified a 40. And that's enough to cause uh, RabbitMQ to, um, as it's attempting to deal with this message, it eats up all the available message, uh, all the available memory, and gets killed. So, so I'm talking. So I showed you the demo, and I delivered the exploit. The, you know, the bad open message, and you saw RabbitMQ. You know, died, and it went back to the command line. Um, and so, what exactly happened there? Um, so traditionally, in cybersecurity, we've been really focused on buffer overflows and process crashes. So if you start getting interested in cybersecurity, everyone says, oh, go read that paper, um, Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit. And, and you go read it, and it's a good read. Um, but that's really only one kind of bug and one kind of failure. So um, historically, we've really focused on that. Uh, and, and, these, and part of it's because it's so easy to mess up buffers when you're coding in C. Um, and also, um, you know, if the conditions are just right, then uh, you, you can actually, as an attacker, you can supply an input that contains your own code that ends up getting executed. And that's called remote code execution. It's, and it's super cool. But it's only, you know, like one kind of failure. Um, and, and these types of crashes are very much about uh, reading or writing memory that doesn't belong to you. So you get a segmentation fault, and the process crashes. And it's very obvious that a failure has occurred. Um, but there are other types of failures, uh, such as resource exhaustion. And we'll talk a little bit about those. Um, you know, historically, uh, uh, Java came to prominence. And, and one of the big things about Java was that uh, you couldn't have a buffer overrun, like uh, you wouldn't have a crash from it. So if you tried to write past the end of a buffer, instead of having your application crash, it would throw a, a array index out of bounds exception. And, and it wouldn't actually have a process crash. And there wasn't actually any exploit mechanism by which you would be able to uh, supply your own code and an input and have it get run. So the programming environment or the runtime environment of applications makes a difference, and it's important. Um, but even so, there are plenty of other ways that software can fail, uh, as we'll see. So one of the reasons um, Java sort of d denies these kinds of failures is that it has this virtual machine architecture. So it's, it's sort of another uh, layer of insulation between your application and the and the the metal, like the processor, um, that makes it harder to do certain kinds of failures. So, so a crash is an obvious mode of failure. Um, a kernel panic is an obvious mode of failure. But there are all these other different ways that software can fail. You can accidentally leak information that you shouldn't be leaking, which is um, what Heartbleed was. Uh, you can uh, end up in an infinite loop uh, so that your application becomes unresponsive. You can eat up memory or processing power or disk space inappropriately, um, you know, in some sort of loop. Uh, you can have a, uh, data in the application that gets messed up somehow, and uh, you don't really notice that until later usually. Like maybe if you have a database that ends up getting written with garbage, that, that would be a problem. And then sometimes uh, things just stop working that should still be working. So that's broken functionality. The things that cause these are, are always you know some mechanism in the code. So basically, developers make mistakes because they're human. So 
Uh, for example, they might not check that data doesn't get written past the end of a buffer. That would be a buffer overflow. They might not um, validate the input that they're getting correctly. Uh, they might handle memory incorrectly, and, and so on and so forth. And then um, in another bucket, we've got the consequences of these things. Uh, so it might mean that you've lost money. It might mean that you don't have the computing resources you thought you had. Uh, and um, for cyber physical systems, it could mean destruction or, or death as well. And that the real kicker is that there's a completely arbitrary and completely unpredictable relationship between the mistakes that developers make in code, the way that the software fails, and the consequences of that failure. You just cannot call it. So um, all you can really do is, uh, is do better testing while you're making applications and try to make sure that the software doesn't fail or, or fails for under minimal sets of circumstances. And that's one of the great things about fuzzing, is that you're sort of bombarding an application with badly formed inputs uh, to see when things go wrong, when it fails. And then once you know that, you can go and fix it and make it better. So you can make your application more robust and, and more secure. So we talked a little bit about failures in C and Java. Um, Erlang is, is kind of an interesting environment and to be honest not something i had really encountered until i started this research with the message brokers so erlang um, if you think about building an application that responds to like a network protocol um, you're, you're getting these messages in you're trying to parse them and figure out what they are and what to do with them uh, and so the normal model of programming is that you basically try to think of every possible thing that could go wrong and write code for it. Uh, so you say, oh, well, what if I get a, a, you know, a type that's not a type I recognize? What do I do then? Or what if I only receive half a message? What do I do then? And, and so on and so forth. And Erlang uh, kind of inverts that model uh, with the what's called a fail-fast philosophy. Uh, so the, the idea with Erlang is that you write code uh, to, to sort of match the way things should happen, and when they don't, you just let the you just let that code die, and then there are uh, supervisors in your application that um, you know when things fail, they'll recreate the appropriate thing to uh, try again or, or or skip over the failure or, or whatever. But the point is is that it's kind of an inversion of the traditional way of doing network parsing or um, network protocol parsing or file parsing or, or dealing with any kind of input. And then um, the, the reason you would do this is that um, it, parsing is always hard. Like uh, if you look at the way, uh, if you look at the most of the vulnerabilities in the world, they have to do with um, oh, this application didn't respond correctly to this input that wasn't quite right, and so on and so forth. Uh, and part of the challenge is that um, when developers write parsing code, uh, they, they have in front of them a specification of, of what the data should look like. And so they're sort of expecting it to look like that. And so they code, I would say, optimistically uh, to, to parse the data that they're getting uh, in an expected format. Um, and of course, input uh, is never to be trusted. Uh, and so um, when you're parsing input data or, or validating it, you have to be especially careful and, and code defensively. Uh, and so Erlang's fail fast philosophy um, helps uh, kind of invert this model and, and makes it good for applications like message brokers. Um, and then it, finally, like Java, Erlang has this virtual machine architecture where uh, your application code isn't actually running on the processor, it's running on a virtual machine on top of the processor. And that means that certain types of failures are, are 
application layer failures are nearly impossible. Uh, and so you're very unlikely to have, um, for example, a, a remote code execution type exploit. However, um, despite that, uh, think about other failure modes. So obviously, um, you saw in the demo, I sent a test case and uh, the application went down, the virtual machine went down. Uh, and so obviously that's bad, it's just a different kind of failure. Uh, so um, at the very least, it would be a denial of service. Uh, if an attacker can run my little Python script and cause uh, a message broker to die, then obviously that's a problem. So um, kind of the last topic here I want to talk about is uh, using Docker containers uh, for fuzz test targets, um, because this turned out to be a really good way to uh, see problems with resources like memory. So if you think about how you would do this normally, um, if, if you had an application like RabbitMQ and uh, it had this vulnerability where it would eat up all the available memory, normally you might run RabbitMQ on its own computer in your lab or maybe on, an, on a virtual machine. Um, but it would be hard to see a memory exhaustion bug because sort of by default operating systems give you as much uh, RAM as they can and they also give you this swap space on disk. And so when the RAM fills up they'll take unused parts of it and write it out to disk and use that RAM uh, sort of as additional RAM and so if you do have uh, an application that's consuming all of the available memory, uh, it's, it's not going to like immediately crash. So it'll eat up all the available memory and then the operating system will thrash around for a while, um, swapping out that memory to disk and, and going back and forth and trying to give the application as much memory as it possibly can. Uh, and then eventually, uh, in Linux at least, there's this thing called the OOM killer, the out of memory killer. Uh, and if a process is taking too much memory, the operating system's OOM killer will, will shut that process down. But under like normal circumstances, uh, there's all this swapping going on and then the, the system becomes less and less responsive and the, you know, it's, it's just thrashing for a long time. So um, putting fuzz targets in containers makes it much easier to constrain the environment. So for a Docker container, it's very easy when you run a Docker container to say, oh, um, this container only has this much memory. And you can say, no, I'm not going to use swap for it. And so that means that uh, when you're fuzzing, if the process eats up all the available memory, it fails quickly because it's not trying to do any uh, swapping to disk or any of that nonsense. And of course, containers provide all sorts of other good benefits, like you can say, oh, I want to put it inside this virtual network, um, which is probably a good idea when you're fuzzing so that you're not interacting with other things. And, um, and you can limit uh, disk space and, and so forth. Um, resources. Um, so that's great about containers. They, they allow you to de define this box inside which your targets run. But in addition, uh, just having a, a Docker file, a, a very repeatable way of creating the container image uh, is really nice for fuzz testing because it um, gives you a very reliable starting point for your fuzz testing, a very repeatable starting point and reliable and repeatable are, are great words in testing. So this is uh, actually an example of um, how I've used containers to, to for uh, fuzz testing targets. So this is for uh, the older uh, vulnerable version of RabbitMQ. So I use um, four different files uh, for each um, software application that I want to test. and one of them uh, just defines the image name. So here it's, it's RabbitMQ pre-built box. And then I've got a build script here, uh, which pulls in the image name. 
and then just does a Docker build like you would do for anything. The Docker build, of course, uses this Docker file, and this one's really simple. I'm just pulling a specific version of, from uh, Docker Hub of RabbitMQ, and then I'm also um, I'm enabling the AMQP protocol, network protocol, because that's what I used for the fuzz testing. And then uh, the run has most of the magic here. Um, we do a, a run, we do dash IT, which means uh, interactive in the terminal. We do dash dash RM so that when this container uh, is finished, it automatically is removed. And then I expose here uh, the AMQP protocol port 5672 uh, so that with my fuzzing tool, I can interact with this application using AMQP. And then this part's the real magic related to memory. I say, okay, my available memory for this container is uh, half a meg of RAM. And then when you specify memory swap that is the same size, that actually means there will be no swap. So I'm just giving it a half a gig and no swap. And so uh, this means that um, as I'm fuzzing, if I am causing memory problems, they show up pretty quickly. Um, this Docker file is, is super simple, um, but I've also done variations on this where I have a Docker file where I'm actually building the application from its source. And of course, those are a little more complicated. But like I said before, the, the repeatability of uh, building these things, assembling them in the same way every time is, is really, really useful. Uh, so before we get to the summary, I just want to go back and show you um, what the exploit script looks like. Uh, so here it is. And so we were talking about fuzzing network protocols. And you can see here um, we actually have this header string, um, which is basically ASCII of AMQP and then a version number. Uh, and so in order to deliver the uh, badly formed open string, um, we first uh, we do a TCP connection to the target, and then we we send that header, protocol header message, and then we receive the protocol header from the message broker, um, and then we actually send the, the badly formed open string. And so that's what the exploit looks like, and and this is just kind of a simplified version of what the fuzzer did in the first place. Um, so I just wanted to show you that. And then uh, let's wrap up. Uh, so thank you for listening. I, I hope you enjoyed the talk. I had a lot of fun doing this research, and uh, I was very excited to, to get these vulnerabilities um, uh, acknowledged and fixed. So uh, to sum up, uh, I, I think all failures are important. Uh, so you know, traditionally, uh, we've focused on process crashes and buffer overflows in, especially. Um, but it's important to remember that cybersecurity is about confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And so uh, any, any damage to any one of those things um, means that you have a cybersecurity problem. So in the case of uh, this vulnerability that I just showed you in RabbitMQ, it's an availability problem. Uh, an attacker can fairly easily render the message broker unavailable for anyone who's using it. Uh, another takeaway is that applications that are even in, you know, air quotes, safe environments uh, like Java or Erlang um, still fail. Uh, so um, you can structure things differently. You can you can kind of rule out certain kinds of failures, or you can um, uh, make it uh, ver almost impossible for developers to make certain kinds of mistakes. But, um, you know, software is software, and no matter where it's running, uh, you can still have uh, vulnerabilities, you can still have robustness problems, you can still have security problems. Um, and then finally, this idea that uh, putting fuzz testing targets inside containers uh, makes it easy to constrain their environment and makes it easy to um, do
do things consistently and get consistent results. So that's the end of my talk. I hope you enjoyed it and um, hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you.